every day in the newspapers, we are reading news about the land rights movement allegedly being pursued on behalf of Aborigines. We have even read in the newspapers several times since last November of how people claiming to represent the Aboriginal nation have been to the United Nations Human Rights Commission seeking the support of that outside body to take Australia to the International Court of Justice uh, in order to question our right to the sovereignty of Australia to in fact declare that the Aborigines are entitled to self-determination which in the terms of international law means their right to secede and it also would mean that the Aboriginal people in fact had sovereignty all over Australia. In the United Nations evidence has been piled up against our country from all sorts of people including such as Al Grasby, people like Charlie Perkins, alleging that the Australian people are racist, which they are not. They are among the most tolerant, if not the most tolerant people in the world. Parliament is uh, divided over debates on the issue. Now the point about all this is that the background to it, the reasons for this movement, which is neither in the interests of the Aborigines or the white people, is something that people discuss every day. And in particular, those people who uh, have either a responsibility for the defence of the country, or the average citizen who is now becoming deeply agitated about what all this is about. And they come to debate this issue and to explore its uh, significance from various backgrounds. I can only tell you of my own background and my own concern about it, and that is because I grew up as a member of the Communist Party in the sense that my father was a member, and as a child I believed in those views, and as soon as I was old enough, which is 18, I became a member myself. And I remained a member for 13 years. Now, one of the points I would make about the Communist Party is that apart from the fact that everyone had to be active and to participate in their work, they all went through a very intensive campaign of education. You can call it uh, indoctrination, brainwashing or whatever you like. But I doubt if I spent a week of those 13 years in which I did not take part in some form of study usually a, a class once a week, perhaps of only an hour. But then you would have fortnightly classes. Sometimes you would take off work and go away to school for even six weeks at a time, such as what was then the secret communist training school in Minto, New South Wales. They taught uh, historical and dialectical materialism, Marxian economics, philosophy, strategy and tactics. But there was one theory that I never took at all seriously. Being in Melbourne and also being based in the union movement and not seeing much or knowing much about Aborigines, we were taught about the theory of the national and the colonial question. It had been developed by Joseph Stalin under the instructions of Lenin. Now, put simply, that theory was that the best way to achieve power in any country that had indigenous peoples, such as in Australia with our Aborigines, was to start what you would call an anti-colonial movement for the indigenous peoples to regain their land. Linked with that were issues of promoting so-called multiculturalism and multiracialism, which would break the homogeneity of the nation which then allowed the communists to take power. Now, with regard to the Aborigines, I never, as I said, took this very seriously. And it wasn't until several years after I was expelled from the party, that was in 1960, that I started to read in the newspapers about the developing land rights movement 
claims being made by Aborigines, uh, sympathetic newspaper editorials, and so on. And I started to think to myself, good heavens, this is the theory that we were taught about in the Communist Party. And of course, another uh, nudge to make a person with my background wake up to what was happening is that some of the people you would see speaking allegedly on behalf of the Aborigines on the television would be people that you'd grown up with in the Communist Party. And as I said, I'd been in the trade union movement all my life. And when you work at the trades hall, you're never away from communist propaganda and literature. And in any case, being a former communist, you still read their material to study the course and direction of their activities. And it became very clear to me how communists were manipulating this movement. On top of this, in 1970, I took on the position of Industrial Relations Officer for the Royal Australian Nursing Federation. My job with them was to have nurses' salaries increase to a level that would give them professional recognition, penalty rates, etc. So that in 1970, I went to the Northern Territory to study the first brief that I had to prepare on their behalf. And that was for what Aborigines should be, uh, what uh, nurses should be paid who work with Aborigines. And in studying the nurses' work in a cross-cultural situation, there again I actually saw communists in operation. Communist literature was all around the settlements. And then again in 1972, when the Whitlam government came to office, they introduced the policy they called self-determination. Now, self-determination in international law means the right to secede. But the way it was sold to the people was that self-determination was merely to give the Aborigines more control over their own affairs, more dignity and autonomy, which mo most people would not argue about. And that was not really the issue. But what we had to confront and deal with as a nurses' organisation was that in the name of self-determination, Charlie Perkins and these people promoted and got going a move to throw the police off the settlements. And we had the problem that under Aboriginal law that it has no way of coping with the problem of alcohol. And as a result of the spread of alcohol among Aborigines and the consequent violence, and the absence of police, who used to do a very good and sympathetic job, for which they were supported by the Aboriginal leaders, in stopping fights and in stopping killings. As Whitlam's program proceeded, there was deaths on the settlements in the Northern Territory, and some nurses were having spears thrown at them, and myself and other officials of the Royal Australian Nursing Federation became heavily involved in disputation with the government, in negotiations with ministers, in visiting settlements. And throughout the rest of Australia, we would receive correspondence from nurses deeply troubled by what was happening. We would have deputations from Aborigines themselves. One example I'll cite just by way of evidence was at Ewandumu, a settlement about 120 miles from Alice Springs, where apart from the fact that the Aborigines themselves were supporting the nurses and asking us for support to bring the police back to stop violence, we also had appeals from Aborigines uh, to stop having uh, their compatriots who were Christians being beaten up for going to a Christian church. It was the first time I realised that there was such a controversy. And the nurses used to tell us how they'd say, well, look, that crowd over there, or that tribal group or settlement, we never have any trouble there because they're all Christians. And we, I again got quite involved in that, although I never understood uh, the full issues. Now, the <coughs> in order to uh, try and uh, 
get this message across to the Australian public as to what was taking place and what were the objectives of the communist movement, I wrote a book called Red Over Black. And in it, what I've done is to mainly uh, quote material that was readily available to the average citizen that he could check through newspaper files, through local libraries. I quoted only a few communist textbooks, uh, but as well as that, dealing with my own experience. Since then, because of the number of questions I've received, and I quite understand that, that people would wonder and be cre incredulous about how clever and how highly involved the communist movement is in our society and how it has been directing this land rights movement. So that I have produced another book, a smaller book called The Evidence. Now in that, <coughs> I've gone through the communist archives that are in the Mitchell Library in Sydney and in other libraries, but I mention the Mitchell Library particularly because you can find almost everything there, in which they have got all of the newspapers, journals, textbooks and other theoretical material from the communist movement since 1920. And I've shown in this little book how the communists themselves, in order to explain to their own members what they had to do, explained how the ultimate objective is the establishment of a new separate independent nation of Aborigines, and they say it in those very words, that that so-called Aboriginal nation is to be uh, recognised uh, by countries in outside Australia, that they are to have their own army. Now we all appreciate the fact that the Aborigines neither have the numerical strength, supposing they even wanted this sort of thing, to establish an army. But the idea of an army on land rights areas is to bring in uninvited Asian and other so-called refugees or migrants. Again, that is very well documented from their own sources. Now, as I said, we are discussing a question of Australia's defence and its security, the importance of which cannot be underestimated and concerns the interests of every Australian, their children and the children in the future. It also concerns the welfare of the Aborigines who are being manipulated by these white communist activists. Now, one of the reasons they have been able to get away with this for so long is that they've got a trigger word, McCarthyism. Even though, as you will be able to see when you read the evidence, all read over black, by checking what I've said in that book, and I appeal to people to check the accuracy or otherwise of what I'm saying, and that's why the original sources are quoted. But you will see there how they explain very clearly how they've been organising Aborigines into the communist movement, how they've been developing programs on behalf of Aborigines, and the point is that you will find the names of people there mentioned. People like Don McLeod, who've been working among the Aborigines there for many, many years. I remember once when I was first in the Communist Party, they were calling for volunteers to go and work among the Aborigines. Again, I never took that at all seriously, being a union official. But in using that trigger word racism, they try and push people into a position of moral cowardice or fear, such as they do by using the trigger word racism, as a cover to their activities. Probably the classic example of this that we've seen in Australia has been in the case of the Queensland Premier Joe Buljeki Peterson, who's one politician who has spoke out openly on this issue. Uh, he's shown an understanding of what it is all about and has spoken in the defence of Australia. Now you, you see these particularly uh, in the southern states, uh, cartoons of uh, 
travel Jicky Peterson looking like Frankenstein. The Queensland people are supposed to be part of the deep north, something like an alleged Ku Klux Klan area in the southern part of the United States, none of which reflects accuracy. Fortunately, people are now beginning to wake up to this. You've got the Return Servicemen's League have shown uh, that they are sick to death of this uh, use of the term McCarthyism. People can, are now beginning to understand uh, just how that has uh, stopped them from thinking about the defence of their own country and their own security. Now, one of the problems I found myself is, is that in getting to people, uh, that is to get your message across, that you've got to have organisation. And I'm dealing here with the role of the Labor Party. Now, I was told while a member of the Labor Party in Victoria that I could no longer renew my ticket. Uh, because they wouldn't tolerate anybody in that party going around speaking about the alternative case on land rights and raising these issues from a defence point of view. So without the support of the Labor Party or even the right to speak within their party, it became a question of seeing who else would help. Now I had the problem of uh, publishing a book, getting people to support it and so on, and the first politician I went to see was Joe Biljicki Peterson. I had certainly tested out a few others. And he did the right thing as a politician. He got me to write out a very lengthy statement in which I had to explain all of my views, my own background, and I had to sign every page, which he then submitted to the Queensland Parliament, which was put in Hansard so that anybody could check what I've been saying. Nobody has been able to uh, counter that by way of ridicule, that is at least ridicule of the facts. It then became a question of being able to go out and talk to the people. Now I went to the Liberal Party, particularly in Western Australia, where a lot of members of that party gave support by promoting meetings. In fact, I've been to just about everybody. I've had excellent support from members of the National Party up in Queensland and uh, including Western Australia and other individual National Party branches and Liberal Party branches throughout the Commonwealth. I've spoken to innumerable church groups of all different uh, persuasions. I've spoken to everybody from the League of Rights who have really given me excellent support in this campaign. I've gone back and I've spoken to many of my union colleagues. I've addressed Australian Council of Trade Union conferences, meetings of the Trades and Labor Council and so on. And one of the methods that the communists have been using to try and stop me and other people from speaking out about these issues is to use the smear technique of this McCarthyism, racist, etc. And it should be on a moment's reflection, when you hear this word racism, you should remember that they are also talking about you. They'll say some organisation or politician or individual is a racist uh, to try and get the rest of Australians not to listen to their views and at the same time they are supporting this application before the United Nations uh, to try and say that the Australian people as a whole are racist and it is a weapon being used against us. I therefore put it to you strongly that as a defence matter, Australians have all got to consider how these trigger words McCarthyism and racism are used to stop them from thinking about the real issues. Now one of the problems that we have in unions from time to time is that there are important legal questions that have to be discussed. Often it might be an amendment to the Arbitration Act, the union's rules, a demarcation dispute, or something else. But the legal questions are involved are so important that they have to be explained to the entire membership. 
Now, if you were in the position that somebody was trying to frame you up as an individual on some charge or other, you would be forced, in order to defend yourself, to study the law books. Now, in this case, Australia is in the world scene, being charged with so-called racism and the oppression of a minority of people, the Aborigines, which is patently untrue. And the smears are not being supported by 99 out of every 100 Australians. But because the United Nations is being geared up as an instrument to recognise the land rights areas as an independent nation and to impose sanctions, which is now being openly discussed against Australia like they did in Rhodesia, then it is incumbent upon all Australians to have at least some knowledge of the international legal uh, arguments being used against us and how they should be counted. Now, I said earlier that the argument about the Aborigines having sovereignty over Australia involves questions of international law. We have before Parliament at the present time a resolution being put by the Labor government in which they state that they are prepared to recognise that Australia was taken by conquest. That means that this government is saying they are prepared to state that the British government invaded Australia and took it from the Aborigines. Now nobody is denying that the Aborigines lived in Australia prior to the coming of the white men. But if in terms of international law, and I ask you to consider that we are only talking about the meaning of words in international law, if we say that the Aborigines owned and occupied Australia, it means that they had an organised, civilised society such as we would equate with a nation state or a group of nations. In Victoria, the government there introduced a bill in which the first thing they said was that we recognise the prior ownership and occupation of Australia by the Aborigines. Now that's the type of evidence that is being used against Australia in the United Nations to say that we live here illegally. And it is the basis of a new campaign being run by the Marxists involved in manipulating the land rights movement is that they are saying that we now have to pay the rent for the right to live here outside of the land rights areas. I have another book coming out in interna on international law which gives the detail from their original sources which you would be able to read to check on what I am saying. But any citizen reading the daily newspapers will be able to pick up this information. Unfortunately, the issue is not being debated into clarity in our parliament any more than the real issues behind Asian and the new wave of Negro migration being introduced to Australia by the government is being discussed. Now, <clears throat> again, there are publications that should be studied by the serious student, and in our period now, where it's like a bushfire in which all citizens should be asked to play their part in putting out the blaze, it is necessary for them to also know how to check the original sources if they so desire. One of the publications, one of the main publications being used to break Australia's security is a journal called Australian Quarterly. It's got out by the Australian Institute of Political Science, so-called. You can obtain this from 32 Market Street, Sydney or you can get it from your library. And if your library hasn't got it, then get them to order it from the main public salt library in your capital city. The autumn 1983 issue has the most up-to-date plans of attack against Australia. Now, if you were a military person, you could never imagine anything better than to have the enemy's plans put in front of you. But in politics, we sometimes don't recognise what these plans are. So I recommend to you for study 
an article by Professor Colin Tatz of the Macquarie University in New South Wales. He is a lecturer in political science and he has there an article headed Aborigines and the Age of Atonement. It is the most incredible diatribe I have ever read of hatred against the Australian people. It accuses Australians of racism, but most particularly it deals from someone on the other side as to how these legal arguments being used against us by claimants to represent the Aboriginal nation, both inside Australia and in United Nations organisations, he explains what they are about. He points out that in September 1975, that Mr Neville Bonner got up in the House, that is in the Senate, and moved a resolution that the Australian Government recognises prior ownership and occupation of Australia by the Aborigines, and that they should have reparations, etc. This has got nothing to do with giving a fair deal to the Aborigines. It is like the present resolution before the House of Representatives and the Senate by the Labor government, rec stating that they recognise Australia was taken by conquest. And he points out the fact that now that Clyde Holding has made statements to this effect, that that is the beginning of a historico-legal fight to come. And when you see in the newspapers about these applications being made against Australia, you've got some idea of knowing what it is about. It is to alter Australia's standing in international law. Now I'm not suggesting that any of these arguments have got any valid basis at all, they haven't. But in Australia you've got politicians based on such grotesque propositions as the Franklin Dam that because we sign treaties or have agreements in the United Nations that that somehow allows our government, the federal government, to ride roughshod over the Constitution by, by using the external affair, powers 